So it sounds like you're going to give it five out of five time displacement yeah. units, Brandon. Absolutely, this thing gets six out of five time displacement units. No, I, I'm the same. You know, I, I've got. It's interesting. Like as a kid growing up, you, you always watch Terminator Two, and it's the, you, you, there's a kid in it. Maybe that's why you connect to it. I don't know. You imagine yourself as John Connor and the, you know, all these things, but uh, you know the rewatchability and the enjoyability factor has always been better for Terminator Two. I have gone back and forth over the years because I felt like Terminator One it gets it gets it gets lost it gets underappreciated by the fact that Terminator Two is so overpowering blockbuster and all that. Uh, so I, I you know it's like oh yeah Dark Horse underdog pick Terminator One's better than Terminator Two and it's like it's it's like the Godfather went into right it's like it's like one A and one B it's impossible to to really say you know which one's Godfather's you know. definitely better than Godfather Two. <laughs> well, well I, I you know I agree on some level but you know what I'm saying here they both won Best Picture Oscars right right um, so for me the reason why this one even surpasses it is because you don't have to have seen the first Terminator to watch this movie is perfect unto itself it gives you every single piece of information that you need to know and it is delivered in such a wonderful way that having just watched the first one it does not even detract (laughs) from having this information told to me again yeah i know i 100 agree with you because for several years i only saw terminator 2 and i I didn't feel like i i didn't feel like i was missing anything (laughs) you know that's a great point that's a great it it is self-contained like if this was just called Terminator, and there was nothing else. Like this story works as a standalone piece. I that's a great point. Yeah, like like Halloween twenty eighteen, just called Halloween. This could have just been called the Terminator, right? Right. That, yeah. If this came out a few years later, they would have the, the thing. <laughs> that's how they would have called it, right? But uh, you know, and so yeah, thing, uh, yes. five out of five for both of us. But th- you know, this kind of ties into why this is a five out of five. You know, it really pushes it over the over the top, and. It's it's the relationship between John and the Terminator and the fact that the T eight hundred has to sacrifice himself at the end, like that is so like hits you mm-hmm. in the feels, right? Because this this is the kid who's looking for he's been looking for friends, looking for a father figure. He finally finds the perfect one, as the movie itself says, and then he has to die at the end. And you you want to cry with John, right? And like and the whole point of the movie, like the line at the end is like, I know not why you cry, but it's yeah. something I can never do. And he lowers him into the steel and the thumbs up at the end, man. I got that's like that is like Disney movie sadness. You know, seeing that thumbs up into the lava. That's one of the saddest, most bittersweet endings in any film. Yep, you got it. I love it. I think it's great. Um, the reason for me why it's 5 out of 5, it's because it's got the chick from Generations. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, from Aliens Vasquez. as well. Vasquez from Aliens. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Another James Cameron regular right there. So Yes. So there you have it. So, Brandon, uh, we have to do our Terminator impersonator count. Five. This episode. So what what are the tell me the five. So there's um there's the T one thousand doing the stepmom. Mm-hmm. There's Arnold doing the voice of John Connor. Correct. There's the T one thousand doing uh the security guard. Correct. There's the T one thousand doing Sarah Connor. Correct. And what is the other one? There well, is to me, there was another one. When you said five, I was <laughs> wondering what you were going to say. Uh, I, no. I, did, I did not count the T-1000 being a cop because he didn't copy the cop. Uh, no, he didn't copy the cop. Which, which is interesting because that, that plays into our discussion about how they wanted to make you think that this was a human and you know he was the good guy. Because if they were just straight up saying this is a shape-shifting Terminator, the cop should have been played by Robert Patrick, right? And then the guy, you would, logically, you would think that they would just replicate the guy it came across and take over his role in his life, but that's not what they did. So No. I'm sure there's a fifth one in there and I, I wish I would have wrote them down now because I was counting along. I didn't I only counted the, those four. So I I'm not sure which one you'd be thinking of. I think there's another one with uh the T one thousand. No. There's not. Okay. He's right. <laughs> we'll <laughs> to, go with to, four. To, to my count anyway. If anybody else finds one, let us know. Uh so yeah. that's four for this film, plus our two from the first film. That brings our Terminator impersonator count to six so far in the franchise. So our final question, Brandon, is this franchise fatigued? It's one of those tough ones where it's like, yeah, this movie ties it up and it makes it perfect. But I would say no, because it's so good that they would definitely make a sequel to this. And I already know what the sequel should be. What's that? They should be making it with that arm that he left behind. 
right? <laughs> so, like, the, he left another arm behind, right? just like he did in the first one. Oh, there's another callback, too. The way he crawls at the end before the T-1000 stabs him is the way that he's crawling in that machine when he's trying to get Sarah Connor <laughs> at the end, right? So, right. like, even there's another callback, right? Um, but, yeah, he left an arm behind. So there's an arm somewhere in that steel mill. Mm-hmm. There's no chip, they though. Should- so the chip is very important to the, to the, the creation The chip is of Star. very important. But you're right. They could have said, you know, that that they should have, like, it's like Jurassic Park, right? Everybody's like, oh, the Barbasol can they left on the island. That's going to be the, the springboard for the sequel. Like, they could have, you know, I'm sure a lot of people are like, oh, that arm they left in the in the, in the the steel mill. That's going to be the springboard for the sequel that wasn't. Now, this is something I thought of um, earlier, too, like, just, just watching and thinking about it, and this is framework. I, I proposed to you a, a different ending for Terminator 2, which could have led into, like, a Terminator 3 of, you know, the future war, right? Hear me out here, right? He, Terminator, in this film, loses an arm, but they have that other arm, right? So they can repair him with that arm, okay? And then he doesn't die at the end. But they don't hit, have the other arm. The no, other I'm, arm, I'm they, proposing to you an alternate ending of the, of the film, all right? I don't like this I, movie. I just... <laughs> I just wanted your take on it, so just hear me out, right? Oh, yeah, I'm So they, they kill the T-1000, right? Arnold is messed up because his arm's broken. They have the other arm, right? They can repair his arm with the arm they do have, right? And then they wait out Judgment Day. Judgment Day still happens, right? But they have Arnold. So they spent all... John Connor, right, has spent all this time with a Terminator, learning about it, its strengths, its weaknesses, all these sorts of things, right? So then when the future war comes, that's how he knows so much about Skynet. And how he, you know, how to defeat them and things of that nature. So that it's like, why do why do these people? Why does this kid that comes out of nowhere to lead the resistance know so much about Sky, Cyberdyne and Skynet and things that they haven't even invented for like forty years? Well, it's because he spent all this time with this Terminator. Like, you know, so that's just. I thought these are this is where my mind went when I'm thinking about mm-hmm. this. Obviously, that would have undercut the whole emotional thing in the movie, which which to me is like the most powerful thing. The fact that Terminator has to sacrifice himself at the end because if a Terminator can learn the value of human life maybe we can too right <laughs> that's the theme of the movie so but you under, you see what i'm saying like they could they could have gone somewhere with that kind of ending as well maybe right but those were also the wrong hands like the one hand was a right hand and the other one was a left you know hand. i was wondering if you're gonna notice that <laughs> i was hoping you wouldn't notice but so yes i just didn't want to see him die it was so sad you know it's like oh no thumbs up you know that's, that's grow sorry, up you big baby anyway so but, but anyway point is Yes, this is a tough one to answer because it's like, is it fatigued? Well, they kind of ended things it's perfectly. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so but, no, it's good enough that I'm like, yeah, when are they going to do Terminator 3? Well, then, then finally, it's like, give us the future war movie, right? Because yeah. that, that's what I like so much about the prologue of this film. We see the we see the future yeah. war. We saw glimpses of it in, in the first one in the flashbacks. Again, doing Cameron doing the same thing, but better, bigger. Right, that's what we see here. We see the blue, uh, the purple lasers, the oh, endoskeletons it so fighting. It, it is amazing, right? And I, I don't know what the story would be beyond like, okay, the end of that film, they they go find the time displacement equipment, they send back Kyle Reese, and they send back the the good Arnold from this film, and that's how you end the franchise, right? Uh, yeah. And then come up with some other plot to fill in the holes before all that, you know. Uh, that would be my at this juncture. I'm still. I know I said that last time. I'm going to say it again at this juncture in the franchise. It's not fatigue to me because that's the movie I want to see. So, mm-hmm. no, it's not yeah. fatigue. Let's see that. That's my answer. What if the the ending is them sending back Kyle Reese and then the good Terminator, and the remaining storyline is uh, Quint on the Indianapolis? <laughs> That's a great idea, Brandon. I think that would really that, would, that really subvert expectations, I think, for Terminator Yeah, 3. and it could be like a jaws eater. So, on that note, Brandon, <laughs> it's been a lot of fun talking about Terminator 2 Judgment Day with you. If people want to find you out there on the internet, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter, at Brandon Matella. Uh, you can find me over on Trek FM with a show called The Line, which is a new podcast devoted to Star Trek Picard, which is coming we don't quite know when. Uh, and I'm wrapping up my run on Warp 5 over there. We thought we were going to end with 200, but we might be ending with 202 now. I think we came up with a couple more that we wanted to get out. Um, you could find me over on the Phantom Podcast Network with my friends Chris and Tom. And that is a show called Good Evening, an Alfred Hitchcock podcast. 
and over there we talk about Hitchcock films one at a time. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. So, Zach, where can people follow you? find you when you're not bawling your eyes out because Arnold Schwarzenegger died at the end of this movie? <laughs> well, you can find me personally on Twitter at MoronZach. That's M-O-O-R-E-O-N-C-A-C-H. I'm also the host of my own podcast, Always Full into Smallville, where we talk about each and every episode of that Young Superman show. You can find us on Twitter at Always Smallville. Again, several episodes of which feature Dr. Miles Dyson, Joe Morton, as another eccentric scientist doctor over there in the first couple seasons. Uh, I'm also host of Standard Orbit, Trek FM's original series podcast. You can hear us over there at Trek FM talk about all things old and new, Captain Kirk and the Enterprise. Excellent. Uh, at this time, we'd like to thank our executive producers of the network, Tony Robinson and Ken Tripp. Uh, we greatly appreciate all their support behind the scenes, as well as Zach Tripp for composing our wonderful theme song music for the show. You can find the United Federation of Podcasts on Twitter at UFP Earth, and you can send us an email if you like, contact at UFP.Earth. Send us an email and send us an MP3, right? We're, you know, if you want to send us a clip for us to put in our recap show for Terminator or any of our other films that are coming up. After Terminator, we're going to be doing the Man With No Name series. So, you know, like, if give you a little heads up if you want to know what's coming up next later in, in Franchise Fatigue. You can get ahead, start watching ahead, and then send us an MP3. We'd love to hear from you for any of our previous series as well. So, uh, but that's all we've got for you. Until next time, talk to the hand. Hasta la vista, baby. This has been a production of MTMR Media Works.